Okay, so for this question here, we are asked how many lines per centimeter are there in a diffraction grating if the third dark fringe is located five centimeters away from the central antinode when the screen is located 60 meters, or sorry, 60 centimeters from the grating and the wavelength of the light is 500 nanometers. Okay, so this is a double slit calculation. Yes? Nanometers into meters. What is that? Uh, nanometers to meters. Um, for one nanometer, there are ten to the negative nine meters. Yeah. Really small. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm happy you brought that up because yeah. So in this question, so we are we have two of the three units are in centimeters. So I'm just going to change one to centimeters, so it's just less work to do, right? So we are asked how many lines per centimeter. Uh, when we calculate our answer, we're going to get how many centimeters per line, and that's the diffraction grading. So that is going to be our D value, okay? What is our D? So the third dark fringe, so there's our central bright spot. And then we have a node. Bright spot, node, bright spot, node, bright spot. This is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Our third dark fringe is 1, 2, 3, which is right here. So our n is 2.5. It's halfway between 3 and 2. Okay, so we know n is 2.5. Um, the distance of the dark fringe from the central bright spot is five centimeters. And the length or the distance from the screen to the slits is 60 centimeters. And we also know that the wavelength is 500 nanometers. Okay, we are asked what is our distance or what is our diffraction grading, okay? So, um, this is a double slit calculation, and we do not have an angle, so we're going to use the formula lambda is equal to dx over n times l. We are isolating for d, so I both multiply both sides by n times l, and divide by x. Okay, so then we get d is equal to n times l times lambda over x. Punch that into our calculator. We have 2.5. Length is 60 centimeters. Oh, and I need to change my wavelength. So this is in nanometers. So I'm going to put it into centimeters. So using your unit conversions uh, sheet, or part on your formula sheet, um, we need to know that for one nanometer, we have 10 to the negative 7 centimeters. Okay, so this will give us our wavelength in centimeters, so then we'll get 5 times 10 to the negative 5 centimeters for our wavelength. Ten to the negative 5, and divided by x, which is 5 centimeters. Okay, so you punch this into your calculator, you will get a size of 0 0.0015 centimeters per line. Okay, we want to know how many lines per centimeter we have. Okay, so we just need to take the inverse of this. Okay, so 1 divided by 0 0.0015 centimeters per line, which will give us a value of 667 lines per centimeter. Okay? All good? Yes, you will be doing the text of problems. Yes. Okay, uh, 
693, question three. Are you guys done on this one already? Yeah. These birds yeah. are really tricky. Okay, so... <laughs> with all like the distances yeah. yeah it yeah so that's probably going to be like the trickiest part with this is all of our different units just making sure that our distances have the same units okay so uh diffraction grading has 1000 lines per centimeter And we want to find the size, how many um, centimeters are per one line. So we will just take the inverse of that, which is equal to 0 0.001 centimeter per line. Wavelength is given is 750 nanometers. Nanometers. Okay. And that is equal to 7.5 times 10 to the negative 5 centimeters. Length is 3 meters, which is equal to 3,000 centimeters. And what is the separation distance between bright spots? So that is just going to be an order of 1. And we are looking for how far those spots will be separated. Okay, so again, this is a double slit calculation and no angle is given. So we will use lambda is equal to dx over n times l. We need to isolate for x. So we will multiply both sides by n times l. and divide by d. Now we have x is equal to n l times wavelength over d. And if you punch in all of your values there, you will get an x equal to 23 centimeters. Why is n1 down? Um, because the separation between bright spots um, it's a, a thousand lines per centimeter. Um, okay, so the distance between bright spots, so like the refracted light, right? Um, it's just saying that the distance between the bright spots are three meters. From, so the screen is three meters away, but what is the separation between bright spots? And so between any bright spot, so if we go between three to two or two to one, we're still going to have an order of one there, right? So that's why our n is only one. Okay. And like, say if it, so say if there's like this question would be one, but say if it like had every other, so then n would be two. Um, no. if, if it was like, if it, what is the separation between like two bright spots? Then it would be, here's a bright spot, here's a bright spot, and then in total we would have... Um, if it was between two bright spots, then our n would be three. Okay, good, good questions. Okay. Okay, so today uh, we're going to talk about Poisson's spot. Okay, so in 1818, a French physicist, Augustin Fresnel, developed a mathematical wave of theory, which was refuted by Poisson, who was a particle, particle model supporter, so a particle model of light, right? Poisson said if light diffracts, there should be no shadow, or if there is, uh, there should be a bright spot in the center of a shadow, which would be produced by a circular object, okay? So basically, if you hold up like a, a basketball here, because of the way that the light is going to be refracted over the basketball, there should be like a bright spot in the middle of the shadow behind that basketball. I don't know, it's kind of like woo woo, woo woo science, but um, it's it's true actually. This is this is a real thing. Wait, it is. This this is a real thing. Yeah, and I'll show you guys a video that will uh, kind of support that. Right. 
Um, yeah, so as what we have, we have a point light source. So you can think of that as like a, essentially like a, just a flashlight, okay? We have an object, so you can think of that as a basketball. And then around that basketball, light waves are going to be diffracted around the edge, and then they're going to um, come together and form a bright spot behind the object, okay? So this is termed Poisson's spot, okay? Um, and this is due to the interference of diffracted light rays. So if there is a bright spot in a sea of darkness, what type of interference would be uh, responsible for Poisson's bright spot? Constructive? Yeah, yeah, for sure, right? Because if it was destructive, like everywhere else, right, it would just be black, but because there's a little bit of light in there, we do have constructive interference, for sure. Excellent. So further experimentation uh, displayed the bright spot, which was named after Poisson. Um, and this also provided further evidence that light was wave-like because it was being uh, bent around that obstacle, around whatever it is, right? Um, and finally, by about 1850, uh, the wave model of light was generally accepted in the scientific community. So it took a few hundred years, right, for it to kind of be supported. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of brought us to where we are today. Okay, uh, here is a video on Chris on Spot, and it will be a lot uh, better at describing it and showing what it actually is than myself. Okay, so yeah, so part of Newton's argument was based on the polarization of light. So this is uh, described as the appearance of two images uh, while viewing an object through a min mineral known as Iceland spar. So it kind of like diffracts it a little bit, right? Um, yeah, so just kind of like how it duplicated, he was interested with that, right? He's like, wow, what is going on here? Um, and so Newton said that the particles of light had different shapes and sizes, and the polarization occurs when um, like the spar would be like that, built, like that glass block that he was looking at through. Um, and polarization occurs when the spar will sort them out, okay? So we have just incident particles just traveling along, just cruising, doing their thing, right? And then they hit a vertical polarizer. <clears throat> so remember, polarizer is going to uh, orient electromagnetic radiation, so it only has one direction to it, right? You're either like taking the horizontal component out of it, and you're only allowing the vertical to get through, or you're taking the vertical out of it and allowing the horizontal to get through, right? It's one or the other. Um, if you do a vertical and then a horizontal polarizer, um, because you've already taken out those vertical waves, they're all horizontal, so then once they meet a horizontal polarizer, it will just kind of uh, stop moving, right? And then on the back, no more light will pa pass through, uh, because, yeah, the vertical waves and now the horizontal waves have both been eliminated and there is nothing left, essentially. Okay, uh, so today polarization and spar phenomena are explained in accordance to a theory uh, first proposed by Young and Fresnel in 1820. According to that theory, so natural unpolarized light will vibrate in many planes, right? So light coming from a sun, it, like you mentioned in there, it's not all going to be in phase, right? Some of it's going to be at different um, like points along their wavelength than another, right? They're not all arranged and organized in a neat manner, right? So yeah, every, it's just coming everywhere. Light's coming at us in every direction, right? Um, once that light is passed through a polarizer or a, a lens that will polarize the light, only a particular orientation of the light will be able to pass through, okay? Uh, this light which passes through is called polarized light because it is only oscillating in that one direction, okay? And yeah, just kind of what I just mentioned, um, if you then you put it through a second polarizing lens, 
um, if you've taken out the vertical um, oscillations on the first lens, and then on the second one you're taking out the horizontal oscillations, um, then the light will be completely filtered and there will not be any light allowed to pass through, right? That's like a double polarizer. Um, not the most convenient kind of system for sunglasses, right? <laughs> we like to see, yeah, we like to see. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, this is um, kind of what we've been talking about. So an unpolarized beam is oscillating in a bunch of different directions. Once it hits a polarizer, it will then only be oscillating in one particular, either horizontal or vertically. Okay, uh, typically polarized sunglasses will take out the horizontal component of the light and that's usually uh, attributed as like the glare, right? So. Um, yeah, polarized sunglasses are super nice. I don't think I'll, like, at your age, I feel like you lose, like, a pair of sunglasses, like, every day, right? <laughs> um, when you get a little bit older, um, you, I haven't lost a pair of sunglasses for, like, two years. So I'm, like, a little bit more, like, I'm not afraid to, like, spend a little bit more money on them because, you know, I'm not just going to, like, lose them in a field or something, right? Although I did lose a pair... Uh, while I was kayaking. Do you guys want to hear a stupid story? Okay, yeah, good, yeah. Yeah. That was silly. Anyways, <laughs> I hope a fish is like vibing with some like sunnies on and a GoPro just taking selfies. <laughs> Speaking of sunnies, sunglass day tomorrow, right? Right. Bring your, bring your shades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'd be like polarizer, see how effective it is. <laughs> right on. Okay, um, I have some applications of polarization, uh, but I gotta find it because I think I forgot to uh, send this with. There we go. Great. Is to detect. And it's this is uh, read off by a robot, so I'm really sorry but it's a good video. Remember we had ongoing battle between wave versus particle model um, up until the 1900s um, with supportive evidence of refraction, diffraction, and interference. The wave theory was pretty much accepted except for one answered question. How can light travel in the vacuum of space when there's no medium for the wave to propagate through? That was the question. And they came up with this material that doesn't necessarily exist, but they just wanted to like think of something. They're like, okay, hey, well, it needs to move through something, right? It can't just kind of cruise through. Um, so na they named this unusual substance uh, the ether. Okay, so sometimes you might hear like it's out in the ether, right? Uh, this is kind of like what they're referring to. This is just like the fluid that like fills up space, I guess. And that was their idea because they like, there must be something in there, right? There just can't be nothing. So yeah, they called that uh, the ether. Uh, and apparently ether would have the stiffness of a solid, um, but the density of a vacuum <laughs> in order for light to travel near uh, the speed that had been calculated, right? So it, they're assuming that it's like super, super stiff, um, but it's, like lightly dense so it can cruise through it, right? Because uh, they had known that if light um, travels in water versus air, water is more dense, so air slows down, or sorry, uh, light slows down when it goes into water, right? So they're like, okay, well, it has to be a really lightly dense, uh, light density, so it can move at, you know, 3.1 times 10 to the eight, right? and that is in the speed of a vacuum, so it's a little bit quicker than uh, the speed of light on air. Um, yeah, but this didn't seem to make sense, right? Um, and the ether was discarded um, when the explanation of electromagnetic radiation arose, and this is how um, they were able to explain how light travels so fast in a vacuum. Okay, so, Michael Orsted, uh, he showed 
right? Um, that a current produces a magnetic field, right? Remember that? He was the guy that had the compass at the top of like a circuit, and he noticed that that compass needle would deflect when there was a current of electrons going through, right? So that was the beginning. And then remember, Michael Faraday comes along. Thank you, Michael Faraday. Just when you guys thought you were getting rid of him. No, no. Thank you, Mike. That's right. <laughs> and he showed that a changing magnetic field can generate a current. Remember when you guys did that little activity, you had to move that magnet back and forth to make that light bulb go off? Right? You guys remember that? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Oh, on our phones. Uh, phones. Yeah, on your phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was an after school experiment, by the way. No. Uh, yeah, just, just on the phones. Yeah. <laughs> we like magnets. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he showed that changing a magnetic field can generate a current. So he, Michael Faraday, also speculated that light was related to electricity and magnetism. Uh, and this was because he was able to demonstrate that the plane of polarization of light could be rotated by a magnetic field, right? So remember, polarized light being that it is oriented in only one direction, either horizontal or vertical, right? He would rotate, um, he could rotate that polarization using a magnetic field, right? So he's just like, okay, so there is a relationship between light, electricity, and magnetism. Okay, but remember Michael Faraday, he was just the bookbinder guy, right? He didn't really have like a formal education, so he lacked the mathematical ability to kind of connect all of that phenomena, okay? So enter James Clerk Maxwell, okay? So he was a mathematician by training and a really smart dude, so he came up with um, like five, or he came up with a bunch of um, equations. They're called Maxwell's equations. And these are equations that describe the relationship between uh, electricity and magnetism and electromagnetic radiation, okay? So in 1864, he showed that even without wires, um, changing electric fields will produce magnetic fields and changing magnetic fields will produce electric fields, okay? So it's just like, an, and like an, it never ends, right? So electric field produces a magnetic field, which produces an electric field, which produces a magnetic field, which produces an electric field, right? Et cetera, et cetera, right? This is setting up an unending sequence known as electromagnetic radiation. Remember, EMR has uh, an electric wave and it also has a magnetic wave, right? So the propagation of one, like, helps the other one move, right? Electricity generates magnets, magnets generate electricity, which generates magnets, okay, and so on and so on. And this is known as electromagnetic radiation. Okay, um, Maxwell used the concept of displacement current to explain the origin of electromagnetic radiation. This one is important right here, okay? Make sure we know this. According to his theory, it is accelerating charges which produce the changing electric fields, which create magnetic fields, which creates EMR, okay? That is very important. This is how EMR is produced. Alex accelerating charges producing um, changing electric fields, which create magnetic fields, okay? Thus. Thus. <laughs> And we, this, we have seen this a few times before, right? So electric and magnetic fields are at right angles to one another and to the direction of the wave propagation, right? So they're all at right angles, right? So as we move here, we have a right angle coming out of the board and we have a right angle coming up, okay? So they're like all perpendicular to one another. Uh, Maxwell calculated that the speed of EMR should be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And 
also calculated that, uh, or so from that, he realized that electromagnetic radiation will travel at the speed of light. Okay, that is important as well. Okay? So, make sure you know this. Which is related or similar to the speed of light, right? So he's kind of making that connection that electromagnetic radiation will travel at the speed of light. So they travel at the same speed. Because light is EMR, right? What? Light is EMR? Light is electromagnetic radiation. You bet. It's oh, it's because of the chain of the, the phone thing. Yeah, it's a photon, right? No, I said the phone thing. Like when you move the magnet. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's so changing when Changing charges. Yep. Changing. You're making charges accelerate, right? By the presence of the magnet. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, so we calculated that the speed of electromagnetic radiation should be 3 times 10 to the 8, which is the speed of light, which makes sense because light is electromagnetic radiation. All right. Uh, we have talked about this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but we have ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. So ionizing radiation is that which has a really high frequency, uh, short wavelength, high energy, right? And then non-ionizing radiation, this is like uh, radio waves. Uh, this has a long wavelength, small frequency, low energy. Wait, so a TV remote would be more dangerous than a phone? So. Um, from here? No, this is, this is safe. Like, this is all good over here. Non-ionizing on the left. So TV remotes. Yeah, what about the sun? It says the sun's not ionizing. Um, the visible light region from the sun is not ionizing, but the ultraviolet rays coming from the sun are ionizing. Yeah. What a fridge. This one? I don't know. Black, green, right? This one? No. <laughs> this? No, it says a tanning bed. Oh, this is a tanning bed. A tanning bed. Don't go to tanning salons, okay? It's oh. like the quickest way to get skin cancer. Yeah, pretty silly. Okay, um, excellent. Okay, so Maxwell also predicted uh, that electromagnetic radiation will exert pressure on any surface which absorbs or reflects it. Uh, this was later observed and led to the development of the concept of photons. Okay, we've talked about photons a lot. These are particle-like bundles of energy in EMR. And this also uh, led to the concept of the photoelectric effect, which we will learn next chapter. Well, chapter 14. Next week we're doing like an optics week. Okay? Okay, uh, we are almost, almost finished. So, enter uh, Hertz and his experiment, the sparking induction coil. So Hertz, um, this was a few years after Maxwell's death. Uh, Hertz became the first person to produce and detect non-visible EMR, specifically radio waves, that Maxwell had predicted. Okay, you might want to remember who was the first person to produce and detect radio waves? No, Hertz. Hertz. Hertz's experiment. Okay. So is what he did. He uh, set up a receiving loop. I can't remember if I have a video here. A whole fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I don't have a video on that. Um, yeah. Is what he did. He just like ran electricity through a circuit. And when he generated a spark, uh, that sent off um, an electromagnetic radiation wave, which was detected in his receiving loop, which also sparked as How? well. How? So by, by putting electrons, right, through a circuit, if you have like enough resistance, you can make it spark, right? Like a spark plug in your automobile, right? Okay, so you're going to have a spark. When you have a spark, <clears throat> EMR is going to be released, right? <clears throat> um, it could be like 
It could be infrared. Uh, what other kind of waves are produced by electrons moving in a circuit? Radio waves, right? So electrons moving in a circuit. Uh, we also have a spark moving. Radio waves are going to be emitted, received by a receiver, right? So that is designed to uh, detect EMR in the frequency of radio waves. And then from there, he noticed there was another spark on that receiving loop, which was not connected to that circuit. Yeah. So this was the first person to synthesize and detect uh, radio waves. Yeah, Hunter. Right, so mm -hmm. like fire would, would produce electromagnetic radiation? Yep, it produces heat, right? Which is infrared. Yeah, so fire does produce uh, EMR, for sure. A lot of things produce EMR. Yeah. And next week, or in a couple weeks, we'll talk about... Um, Do we? We give off EMR. Uh, we give off infrared, right? Yeah. 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 But we don't give off, like, gamma rays, right? Ionizing radiation. <laughs> Wait, what did you say? Okay, so that is it for Chapter 13 content. Okay, so you guys have uh, the remainder of today's class to... Yeah. Yeah, so you guys have the remainder of today's class to review chapter 13 content or to, well, you got to do those check and reflect um, that we talked about at the beginning of class. Okay, um, quiz topics. So diffraction grading, so pretty much those calculations that we did with from 13, it's pretty much 13.5 onwards, this quiz, okay? So diffraction gradings, puts on spot. Maxwell and Hertz's findings and double slit calculations. Question? No. No? Okay. All good? We have a quiz tomorrow. It's pretty short. So. Will there be any snail stuff on it? Snail? Yeah, snails, snails law. Oh, snails. Uh, no. No snails law. No. What are, what's going to be on the quiz tomorrow? Great.